I'd like you to grab your Bibles, if you would, and go to Matthew 16. Father, may there be fire on this word. May there be holy fire on this word. May revelation establish us. May revelation be imparted into us to flow through us. Paul prayed in the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 11. He, he prayed these words. and He said, I, I long to be with you that when I come to you, that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you might be established, that you might be established. I pray that tonight just for the establishment of the kingdom of God in our hearts, foundational pillars in our heart, foundational understanding, revelation in our heart that just comes alive, just explosively, just alive in our heart. Our future is grand, ladies and gentlemen. I want to remind you tonight, the future does not belong to the God mockers. The future does not belong to the God haters. The future does not belong to the perverted. The future belongs to the God-fearing righteous. The future belongs to the God-fearing righteous. Our future is so epic, we haven't even begun to dream how glorious it is. We haven't even begun to dream how glorious it is. Cody, thanks so much. Love you. Did I tell you Matthew 16? <laughs> I want to read a scripture over you tonight. It's found in Isaiah. Put it in your notes tonight. Isaiah 42, verse 13. And I want to let this just be a foundational stone tonight to just rest on the building of this message tonight. Isaiah 42, verse 13, and it says, the Lord will go forth like a warrior. He will arouse his zeal like a man of war. He will utter a shout. Yes, he will raise a war cry. He will prevail against his enemies. <laughs> Take a big drink on that tonight. The Lord will go forth like a warrior. He will arouse his zeal like a man of war. He will utter a shout. Yes, he will raise a war cry. He will prevail against his enemies. Tonight I want to talk to you for the next few moments. And I, I actually better grab my phone so I have the time in front of me. Because if I don't, we'll have seven minutes to tear down and get this place together. So <laughs> you all know how that is. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk to you tonight about the church that Jesus is building. The cheat, the, the cheech. <laughs> Help me talk, Holy Spirit. <laughs> the church <laughs> that Jesus is. <laughs> Woo. The church. church that Jesus is building. Wow. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> 
I'm being helped. This guy in the front's praying, help him, Lord. I'm being helped. <laughs> wow. I just walked right into a joy bomb. Wow. I prayed Hebrews 1.9 over this house. I don't know if you remember that. That the Father delighted, he delighted in pouring the oil of gladness upon his son. We prayed in our prayer room tonight that the Lord would pour out the oil of gladness in this house. I'm telling you, look, we're all engaged in such a mess in this country. We are, we are engaged in fight after warfare, after fight, after campaign, after campaign, after campaign. And I'm telling you what, the flags of triumph and victory in the name of the Lord are going up. But I'm telling you what, we need to do this with joy. We need to do this with joy. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The church that Jesus is building. The church that Jesus is building, folks, is far superior than just a campus that's being used a few days a week, serving good coffee and having modern services. Take some good notes tonight. Remember this. The church that Jesus is building is his ecclesia. And it is his embassy of heaven. It is the embassy of heaven that builds the throne of God. Literally, a people who build the seat of authority for the expanding and the reaching of the kingdom into every sphere of culture and society with the unstoppable power of the Spirit of God. The church that Jesus is building is a burning apostolic force. It is an undefeatable, it is an unquenchable, triumphing church over all the works of the devil. Jesus said the church that he is building, the gates of hell, does not prevail against it. I think we need to recalibrate ourselves right now to what the true church actually looks like. In Matthew 16, Jesus says, and beginning in verse 13, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, three weeks ago, we were just there in Israel, in Caesarea Philippi, and our team from Israel will remember, this is where, literally, where there was, a, there was a three demon god idols that were set up, one to Zeus, one to Pan, and one to Baal. And this is where Jesus took his disciples in Caesarea Philippi and stood them before a cave that was called the Gates of Hell. And when you go there, you will see an altar that was torn down to Pan, to, Pan, to Baal, and to Zeus, where they literally had human sacrifice and the blood of humans being dumped into the river to contaminate all of Israel. Now, I want to set this up where we're going tonight. So they come into Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist. Are you looking at your Bibles? Are you there? Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. And others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Those are powerful words. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you, Peter, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind or whatever you forbid on the earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose or you permit on the earth will be loosed in heaven, my God. The disciples' answer to this question is so imperative tonight 
Because Jesus really did not care about his poll numbers. He wasn't concerned or even confused about his personal identity or his mission. Are you with me tonight? When Jesus asks a question, he is seeking revelation. Write it down tonight. When he asks a question, you know, when God asks a question of us, he's really not looking for information. He's actually knocking on the door of your heart to find revelation. Amen. Who do you say that I am? Because revelation establishes authority in you. Revelation establishes authority in you. Demons know when a believer has revelation flowing through them. God's people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. Let me tell you, the enemy is fighting every Christian to keep them ignorant. And boy, do we have a lot of ignorant churches in America. Wow, Brian, that's bold. Yeah, but it's true. And that's why, see, Jesus said the church that he is building, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. we got to stop acting like we're doing God a favor by having gatherings and, 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 and Serving up cookies and punch and and everything else to get the masses in. But doing very little to even scratch the surface of releasing the power of the Holy Ghost to transform a region. Are you all okay tonight? I'm really going to go the distance tonight. I'm letting you know. I'm really going to go. The scriptures are absolutely full of transformational, transcendent moments in the scripture. And what do I mean by that? A transcendent moment in scripture is this. It's when a massing, massive unfolding or a collision of eternal revelation suddenly bursts into time. And revelation is what actually shifts things. One of them is when Abraham went to Mount Moriah to offer his own promised son. It was a revelation of Jehovah Jireh that God would one day provide his very own son for the earth. If Moses was here tonight, he would tell you that he had a collision of revelation, that there he was, only a shepherd, and God encounters him as a burning bush and says, I'm literally going to turn you into a deliverer for an entire nation. I'm going to take you from being a shepherd to moving into a literal deliverer of a nation. David is facing a giant with nothing more than a sling in his hand (laughs) and a burning heart for God. And an epic revelation is released into the earth of the power of the name of the Almighty. Revelation crashes into time. And now Peter has this moment. I want you to hear these words tonight. Peter, he experiences this burst of spiritual clarity. He recognizes who has transcended into time. Who has transcended into time? Hear that? He didn't look at Jesus and say, this is just another skilled rabbi and good teacher. This is not just a prophetic messenger. No, He said, you are the Christ, you are the son of the living God. Revelation knowledge. And Jesus responds, he said, you are so blessed because you need to know flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father, but my father in heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you, we still need to have spiritual eyes to perceive. We still have to have ears that truly hear. Jesus would often say, if you have eyes to see, then see. If you have ears to hear, then hear what the Spirit of God is saying. He said, Jesus says, upon this rock, 
I will build my church and the get bless you and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now this word church, write it down tonight. This word church is actually the word ecclesia. And it means something far different than the English word church that we have come to know literally in the present day culture. I will say especially here in America. I've pioneered, I've pastored two churches. I've I've Preach. My wife and I have ministered and preached in hundreds of churches across America and in other nations. But I'm not talking about just church tonight. Because the church that Jesus is actually building, that is the ecclesia, is actually producing something far greater. Exponentially, exceedingly greater than what we're seeing churches in this hour. Are you okay? Are you okay? For real. I need to know. Are you okay? The language of Matthew 16. The language of Matthew 16 is actually a watershed moment of divine revelation. It is a watershed moment of divine revelation. It is actually a turning point in Jesus' ministry. Because the message of Jesus that is released here literally becomes the cornerstone. For the birthing of a kingdom culture in the earth. Wow. He says this rock, this rock of revelation that Jesus is talking about to Peter is none other than the rock of ages himself. The disciples understood this word. Jesus used this word, ecclesia. They understood this word. Now go with me tonight. Take some good notes tonight. Go back, listen to the message again and again and again. Because we're going to be circling back through this again and again. In a few months from now, next year in 2019, 2020, we're not gonna, we're not leaving our assignment. We're understanding we are the ecclesia of God. We're not just gathering because we don't have anything else to do on a Saturday night. We're gathering with eternal purpose in mind to shift our city, region, and nation, and nations of the earth. Come on. Come on. These disciples understood that an ecclesia is literally this. That it's a culture and it's an assembly of people that are sent forth to govern the affairs of a city. To literally govern the affairs of a city or a state or a nation like a parliament or a congress. In the Roman culture, the ecclesia, get this tonight, they were assembly of people who were sent into a conquered region to govern and alter that culture that they were sent into. They were sent to do what? They were sent to govern and alter the culture. Why? So that literally that culture would begin to reflect the Roman culture. That's why they were sent. The ecclesia, after after a military invasion was won, after a beachhead was established for the Roman Armies, then they would send in the ecclesia to begin to alter culture so that culture would begin to be set up and framed up in such a structure to reflect the Roman culture. Are you seeing this? The ecclesia, they, they infiltrated government. They, they infiltrated social culture, language, arts, government, education. Until a people's structure of thought and their ideas and their actions and their way of life literally looked like the Romans. In other words, the ecclesia assignment and commission is this. It was to install the culture or the ideas of the Roman kingdom. So now you see where Jesus is going. Now when he speaks this about the church that he is building, he says the ecclesia, this church that I'm building, literally the gates of hell are not going to be able to prevail against it. Why? Now this is epic. He was announcing that there was going to be a body of people that would literally begin to spiritually legislate. Wow. 
spiritually legislate the intention of the kingdom of God in the earth. You've heard this before. Listen, Jesus could not say anything unless he heard his father saying it. Is that Bible? Where's that found? John 5, 19 and 20. I can't do anything unless I see my father doing it. I can't say anything unless I hear my father saying it. So if Jesus said, you must pray this way, our father who art in heaven, holy is your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See it? On earth as it is in heaven. Then where did Jesus get the authorization for us to pray this? He got it from the father. Because the Father's dream, the Father's plan and dream is that the earth would literally mirror and look like heaven. We have authorization to go there. We have authorization and access to bring heaven to earth. We are the ecclesia that God is building his church to release heaven in the earth. We are Chosen and anointed and appointed to build a kingdom culture in the sour. Hmm, are you with me? I, are you really with me? I think some of you are with me. Are you with me tonight? He said, On this rock, I will build my ecclesia. He said that his father's house would be a house of prayer. For all nations, my Father's house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. The church is to be a bold, radiant, ruling power and authority over the forces of darkness. You're not getting any stickers on the fridge in heaven, gold little stars. On, on Father's fridge in heaven because you're just nice and sweet, pleasant little Christian. Isn't she sweet? <laughs> Isn't he just a darling? Isn't he sweet? We've been doing that forever and getting very little done. It's amazing who God is anointing in this hour that actually gets stuff done. Look at the president. Some of you are with me tonight. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, my. Yeah. Get her done. Get her done. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, back to the message. <laughs> in biblical days, in biblical days, the ecclesia were who? Take some notes tonight. The ecclesia were the elders. The ecclesia, they were the elders. They were the social watchmen and social watch women. And those who literally governed the affairs of the culture of their cities and their towns. They were the ones that built and wrote the legislation of what would be allowed, what was ethical, what was right in their little village and town and city. The ecclesia legislated. You understand? They were the elders. They were the social watchmen. They were the ones that were setting the agenda for what was allowed amongst their own people. Now, you got to hear that again. They were the ones setting the course for what was allowed amongst their own people. Amongst our own people. Amongst our own schools right here in our county. Are you with me? The ecclesia met in a very peculiar prophetic place, and they met in the gates. Write it down tonight. The ecclesia met at the gates of the city. And they met at the gates of the community to legislate and give authorization for life giving community. They met in the gates. This is a strong prophetic revelation for us. For where the true, the true church has been given our place, our position, to give access or closure to something. Remember what Jesus said. He said, I give you authority to either forbid or permit. To either forbid 
or permit, to either forbid or permit. Lord, just keep coming in tonight. Keep coming in. This declaration from Jesus is an extraordinary leap. And when you begin to tap into it, you begin to see the revelation of our very destiny, the revelation of our authority and our dominion of the church. To literally loose the will of God in every sphere of society. Jesus has commissioned you and I. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, he literally says that you and I are ambassadors of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 20, you are literally, you and I are literally ambassadors. We talked about this months ago that an ambassador had to literally be the one who was literally closest to the king. The, the Corinthian church had the they were mind boggled by that word. When they read the letter from Paul and said, we are literally Christ's ambassadors. They knew what that meant. An ambassador had the closest access, the closest level in a relationship to a king to know what the king's will was and the decree of the king. He didn't have Twitter. He didn't have Facebook. He didn't have a social media platform. The ambassador had to spend quality time with the king. He had to carry the commands and the decree of the king and to the nation that he was sent. And he was only allowed to stay there at least two to three years maximum. And then he had orders to return to the king. Why? Because if they stayed more than two or three years in that kingdom they were sent to, they would begin to become sympathetic to the culture they were sent to change. He said, I commission you as my ambassadors. And the reason he sends us forth as ambassadors is because we, we have been given such a great privilege to design earth to begin to reflect heaven's culture. To design earth to literally begin to reflect heaven's culture. Wow. This was the Father's desire from the very beginning. And this is why Jesus gave us the authorization to pray that his kingdom would come, his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. The ecclesia is who? By definition, they are a governmental assembly. Who is the ecclesia? They are a governmental assembly. See, we have to change our way of thinking. The ecclesia is a governmental assembly. That's why, see, this is only 13 months old. You understand that? What's going on here? This is 13 months old. This is why every week you're reminded that we are standing and accessing before the throne of God power. We're not just coming in here and doing spiritual gymnastics and singing a few good songs. We're literally accessing the throne of God as sons and daughters of the Most High God and then moving in power using the name of Jesus. Using the power of the blood, using the power of his name, exercising righteousness and justice. Come on, are you with me tonight? The ecclesia. He said, the gates of hell, it will never prevail over the ecclesia that I build. Notice that Jesus is building the church. Brian doesn't build this church. Our leadership doesn't build this church. Can I just go on the record and tell you, building bigger churches has not reformed America. Church growth programs, bigger church, I'm not slamming big churches. Praise God for them. Bigger churches and, and, the, and the anomalies of big churches has not changed our country one bit. I'm going to get there tonight. I'm making my way. I'm going to get there. Everybody say, God help Brian. <laughs> Thank you. The ecclesia are the ones who shoulder the responsibilities as representatives of God's ruling counsel in the earth. One more time, write it down tonight. The ecclesia are the ones that are shouldering the responsibility as representatives of God's ruling counsel in the earth. You've got to take this personal. 
We can't be like a normal church where 17 or 15 percent of people tithe. The silence of the lambs has hit. I'm serious. I mean, we're talking about changing the world, and we, we've got to just do the foundational things. It goes over like a lead balloon sometimes. Wow. <laughs> See, he, here's the deal. I'm not checking my poll numbers. <laughs> Nobody in here called me to preach. Nobody in here put your mantle or anointing on me. The one in heaven that sits at the right, right hand of the throne of God called me, appointed me, anointed me to preach his gospel. I'm not taking the polls. I'm not fearing man. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. The ecclesia are the ones who shoulder the responsibility. See, here's the thing. Here's what's going on. The Holy Spirit is inviting you into a place to participate with him. Will you, will you step into a place of agreement with me and do this for the nation of Israel? Will you step into a place and come into agreement with me for your legislation, for your nation, for the Senate, for the Congress, for your representatives, for your state, for your nation, for the White House? God is looking for representatives that will actually shoulder the responsibility. My God. Christ is the head of the church. Ephesians 5.23. Say it. Christ is the head of the church. Say it. Come on. Christ is, come on. Christ is the head of the church. But his body remains in the earth. Generation after generation after generation, his body, he's the head. I remember years ago, Rick Joyner said, in the last days, God will have a body that is literally proportionate to the head. I mean, forever we have looked like this huge head and this stick figure drawing. <laughs> this little famished drawing of, a, you know, like a little Pee Wee Herman body. <laughs> oh, Lord, help us there. Sorry. Rick said, in these last days, God is going to have a body that is so powerful, robust, strong, that will literally be proportionate to the head. Let that sink in for a moment. See, the body remains in the earth generation after generation. And why are they here? Why are we here? Why are we here? Why are we here? Let's get to the core of it. Why are we here? To expand the rule and the dominion of the kingdom of God. We are not here just to gather in more and more and more inspirational sermons so that we can get goosebumps the size of hubcaps. And we keep doing nothing with it. I have stood with some of the greatest apostles, prophets, ambassadors, revivalists. I got to be with uh, Sergio, Scar uh, Sergio Scatellini, who wrote the book 20 years ago, The Fire of His Holiness. I got to stand with him, love on him, thank God for how he impacted my life. But I listened to these generals weep behind closed doors for what they have experienced for standing for truth in this hour. I'm telling you, we are in a real fight. We are in a real battle. We are not going to be a people who's going to bury their heads in the sand and act like nothing is going on. Oh, just, Brian, just give us a good, a good service. Just, you know, prance around a little bit and inspire us. Not on my life. I don't want to waste my life, folks. We are called to be the church that Jesus will build, literally that the gates of hell doesn't begin to prevail against us, that we're the ones expanding the dominion and the power and the glory of his rule. I know this is strong. I know this is strong. According to Jesus, <laughs> I love this. According to Jesus, the ecclesia, they're literally a threat to every corrupt human system and human government and principality. You better write it down tonight. According to Jesus, the ecclesia, they will be a threat to every corrupt human government authority and principality. 
I remember when I was sitting in the room for Brett Kavanaugh's hearing when his, when his accuser came against him. And I remember when literally the, the attorneys of that woman that came in approached me in that room on the break and said, Who are you? Who are you and what are you doing here? Who gave you access to be in this room? You know why? It was a threat. My lips weren't moving. I was standing still. I was a threat. The disciples understood what an ecclesia was, but that ain't good enough. Because we in 2018 have to know what the ecclesia is. We, we have to know what the ecclesia is. We have to have a revelation and understanding like never before to take our position and begin to move into our divine assignments. You have a, dis- a divine divine assignment that that is moving towards you and you're moving towards it that God wants you to embrace and say yes to it God I feel unworthy say yes to it God I feel unqualified for it say yes to it God my insecurity she'll say get over yourself I can't even talk Moses be quiet stop talking like that stop making excuses I say this to myself all the time. Get over yourself, Brian. It's a miracle that I'm in ministry. I'm telling you, it's a miracle. I was afraid to get up in front of people and speak. You have no idea. I've had to get over a lot of things. Folks, we've got to get over ourselves. We've got to be bold and stand up and be the representatives and the ambassadors that God has called us to be. You are called to invade the darkness. You are called to invade the darkness. You are called to be a burning torch and a lamp in this hour for this generation. You are called to be the mouthpiece. you got to speak up. Who will stand up in this hour against the evildoers? I know it's strong, folks. Well, thanks. <laughs> Listen to this. In the Great Commission, Jesus said, All authority has been given to him in heaven and in earth. That's Matthew 28. All authority has been given to him on heaven and in heaven and on earth. In, in Mark chapter 16. This is what Jesus said. He told the disciples, he said, go make disciples of all nations. Hear that. Go make disciples of all nations. He didn't say go make some converts in all the nations. He said actually go and disciple the nations. Do you know that Satan heard that decree and he said, I'll take that serious. Because the church is so enamored with having good services. He's good with that. The enemy is enamored. He loves it when the church just goes into good inspirational times and good inspirational meetings while all along he can disciple our nation. Who's been discipling our our government? Who's been discipling the education system? Who's been discipling the arts and the media? Who? Oh, it hasn't been us because we're just good, sweet sheep. We can't aim for the high places. I mean, we, we can't go there. We, we can't go there and do that. I mean, we're just supposed to pass out bottled waters with stickers of our church on it and shake hands and, and just hope that people will come and read our bulletin. I know. I know. I know. He told them, he said, in my name, you're going to go out and you're going to cast out demons. He said, you're going to speak with new tongues. He said, you're going to act, you're going to access and you're going to exercise true authority. And you're going to take power and victory to the ends of the earth. That's what he told him. That's what the commission looks like. See, the church that Jesus is building actually looks like that, power. The church that Jesus is building looks like power. 
authority over all the works of the devil. They expand the kingdom. This is a big point tonight. The ecclesia recognized first and foremost that Jesus holds all authority. I'm going to say it again. The ecclesia, they recognize first and foremost that Jesus holds all authority. Demon systems, demonized systems have to be defeated by the keys that Jesus has given us to the kingdom. I think we have to have our minds renewed who really holds all authority. Because if we're still vacillating right there, we're already sunk. The ecclesia is the living embodiment of the church, or excuse me, of Christ in the earth as his body. What are they? The ecclesia is the living embodiment of Christ on earth, his body. The ecclesia represents his role in the earth. In Joel chapter 2, look at it this week in your Bible study, in your alone time, your intimacy with the Lord. Joel chapter 2, you find the story. The church literally intervenes as intercessory arbiters to a national crisis. And that's where we're going. That's where we're going. That's where the praying and the remnant church is actually going. They're going to be the divine intervention of the hand of God for nations. Man, I feel it coming. Right now, see, the church is going through a massive transformational time. A massive transformational time. It's, it's actually a literal upheaval of the Spirit of God shaking things up. I'm here to tell you, the church is going, before we have a great awakening, we're going to have a rude awakening. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. Everything that can be shaken, it will be shaken. This is a hard one right here. This is a hard point, but it's true. Stay with me. A couple more minutes. It is not enough, ladies and gentlemen, to be a good, healthy church that can evangelize or feed the poor or build the family or that we run excellent children programs. Are all of those important? Are they important? Yes, they are. They're absolutely important. But it's actually going to take the ecclesia, the ecclesia, acting with spiritual authority Across a region to lose transformational power. If we, if we are just a church, then it's just okay to have great children's programs, great services, evangelize, feed the poor, do all those things that are necessary. But if we're actually going to be the ecclesia to build the throne of God, to build the seat of authority of God then we will be the ones to access that power and bring transformational power into a city and region and perhaps even to other nations. Don't miss this point. Don't miss this point. The ecclesia is founded on who? It's founded on the apostles and the prophets. This is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. Put it in your notes. Ephesians chapter 1 and 22, verse 23. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20. See, the mindset, the mindset of sent ones. What, is, what does apostle mean? It means a sent one. Say that. An apostle is a sent one. What is a prophet? They're a visionary. You see it? The apostolic church is built on the apostles and prophets. The ecclesia that God is building was built upon apostles, prophets. That's what the scripture teaches us. The apostles are the sent ones. The prophets are the visionaries. Now, that's far different from pastors and teachers. Don't miss this tonight. They are equally important. Don't miss it. I just said that. They are equally important, pastors, teachers. But the church that Jesus is building is the ecclesia that is literally built upon apostles and prophets. Why? Why? Because the chief concern of God is heaven coming to earth. And being rightly prioritized of that being the vision. Of that being the vision. 
I know this is strong. Mark chapter 11, verse 17, Jesus says, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. A few more points, and we're wrapping up tonight. Prayer, prayer is the key source of the ecclesia. Prayer is the key source and power for the ecclesia. Number two, prayer is the way to strategically and accurately legislate for change and transformation. It's not billboards. It's not signs. It's prayer. Folks, if we don't pray, we will not see strongholds of murder and rape and drug addiction in our region, gang warfare, racism. We will not see it change in our nation unless we pray. You know what we keep trying to do? We keep trying to intellectualize the gospel. We keep, we keep trying to appeal to people's intellect so we sound smart and we have no power. And the enemy is okay with that kind of church. He's just going to sit there and amen those messages all the way and just keep on preaching. Let it roll. It sounds smart. It sounds inspirational. It sounds intellectual. But there's no power to back it up. It's strong. I know it's strong. Prayer is the power of God. Say it tonight with me. Prayer is the power of God. Say it again. Prayer is the power of God. I know you believe this. Prayer is the front line for the bold and the courageous ecclesia. And there could be no retreat. We say this all, all the time around here. The kingdom of God was always meant to shape culture, ladies and gentlemen. Never to retreat from it. The gates. Let's go back to the gates. One more time. The gates. What are the gates? Number one. The gates are the places of, transfer, of transition into something or out of something. The gates are the transition place, place into something or out of something. The gates is both an exit and an entryway. The gate is both an exit and an entryway. In biblical times, the elders literally sat in the gates. This is highly prophetic and symbolic for us as the church. I think it's very, very prophetic that God gave this word over Abraham. You can find this in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 17. Listen to what he said. He told Abraham, he said, indeed, I will bless you greatly, and in your seed they shall possess the gate of their enemies. They shall possess the gates of their enemies. Now, who are those? Galatians 3.29 answers who that is. It says, if we belong to Christ, then we are Abraham's offspring and heirs according to the promise. I want you to take this personal tonight. You are called to possess the gates of your enemy. I want you to make it a declaration and a confession over you. I am anointed to possess the gates of my enemies for my city. I am anointed. I, listen, I, you, you, you think I'm going to Washington, D.C. empty-handed? Not on your life. I'm going there in the promises of God and in the anointing and the power of the Spirit, knowing that God has commissioned us as His ambassadors, as His watchmen, as His warriors, as His worshipers, knowing God has sent us forth to commission us to take the gates of our enemies. Woo! The righteous are as bold as a lion. <laughs> Why is all of this important? Because if the ecclesia doesn't take a stand right now, then we're going to keep losing far too many ba battles for the soul of our very nation. 
rat, rather than just rattling through everything that's imploding in our nation, I'm just going to jump right over that and go to my close. Cody, would you come and join me tonight, brother? I want you to write this down tonight. Heaven's agenda cannot continue to be stalled across the nation because of a sleeping church and a lack of revelation. The will of God and the purposes of God cannot continue to be stalled by spiritually dull people. The Lord wants to sharpen us up, Ecclesia. He wants us standing at attention and trembling at the fear of the Lord at His word. If we can't look at our nation and God bring us to tears and to pain, something's wrong. We cannot continue to just build walls that insulate our lives from the pain of the world. We can't do that. There's far too many churches doing this, building their walls so they can just have good church. While all the while Jesus is knocking on the door of the church saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Does any man hear my voice? gone late tonight. I'm going to finish this next week. I'm going to finish next week. The Holy Spirit is summoning this family that God is building. I want to say that again because it's going to penetrate some of you in your soul and in your spirit. God, the Holy Spirit is summoning this body for a very, very, very strong and high purpose. Hear this tonight. This is why there's so much spiritual warfare that's going on, even right in the midst of us. That's why there's turbulence in spiritual warfare because God is building something of great significance right here. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing the word of the Lord? The Holy Spirit is summoning us to assignments. That in the natural, they could be just way over our head. That we never dreamed or we could see us going. This is what I'm experiencing, and I think others in here are experiencing it. Where the Holy Spirit is saying, Brian, will you believe me? And will you partner and come alongside with me and, and believe me in this and dream with me in this? Will you declare this? Just a few days ago, I was standing in the Florida Embassy House in Washington, D.C., right behind the Supreme Court. It was election day. I met the man there that hosted me. He was a new guy that I hadn't met before on their staff. I told him very clearly why I was there. I told him I'm a pastor from Florida. I told him I was from Sarasota. I said, I got to be honest with you. I said, I'm here to pray for my state. Can you just allow me to be undisturbed in this room to pray over our state and our nation? He said, absolutely. So I stayed in the Florida embassy as an ambassador, as a son, as a son, as an ambassador, and began to intercede over our great state. And I began to look out the windows. And I began to pray over our Supreme Court. I began to pray over Brett Kavanaugh, over his divine assignment. Thank God the enemy was not able to ambush and take him out. I began to pray over his assignment, his life, and his family, and his wife, and his children, and our Supreme Court by name. I began to pray over our state. And I said, Lord, who am I? Who, who am I, Lord? Who am I? I'm going to tell you, that's the wrong question. 
Because I heard it very fresh. Get over yourself. Do what I've called you to do. Declare and decree and pray what I called you to pray and decree and do it. Stand in your place as a son. Stand in your place as a son and a daughter in this hour and be confident and be bold. Don't be insecure. Be bold. Strong. Fierce in the Lord. It's okay to be aggressive for the Lord. It's okay. And I keep hearing the Lord, son, will you step into this with me? I can't believe the rooms that I'm stepping into in this hour. I, 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 I am awed by, by the relationships that I'm coming to, into right now in government for the United States of America. I'm in all of the people that I'm standing in front of and having conversations with. I had a mega prophetic word given over my life that I'm going to keep to myself. Only my wife and my kids and my family know about while I was in Washington. The wrong question right now is, Lord, who am I? The question is, who is our God? Who is our Father? Who is our God? Will you partner with God? Will you stand? Will you partner with God? Will you stand in the place of authority? Will you stand in the place to rebuild the walls of America and the nations of the earth? Will you be an Esther? Will you be a Nehemiah? Will you be a Joseph? Will you be a Moses? Will you be a David? Will you be a Ruth? It's time to take your place strong, strong. I feel like I'm given a commission tonight. I'm telling you, I, I feel like I've been preaching a commissioning service to a mighty army. Did you hear this? Did you hear what I'm saying? I'm going to go back to the front of this train. And at the front of this train, here was the word of the Lord over us. Isaiah 42, verse 13. The Lord will go forth like a warrior. He will arouse his zeal like a man of war. He will utter a shout. He will raise a war cry. He will prevail over his enemies. He will prevail over his enemies. Come on and stand and give the Lord praise tonight. Come on. Give the Lord a victory shout tonight.